18 months ago, I built this carbon fiber bike from scratch using parts almost exclusively from AliExpress. And having now done 3000 miles on the bike, I thought now would be a good time to give an honest review of the frame, the components, and if I'd recommend going down the same route, if you're thinking of building a bike yourself. Also, I hate to be that guy, but stick around until the end for the total price and the weight of this build, because I think you'll be surprised. But before I start, I want to make it clear that while I am a huge fan of budget-friendly items on AliExpress, it is massively important that you do your research on any parts that you're thinking of buying, and that's especially true of something you could be flying downhill on at upwards of 40 miles an hour. So, unless you have really good private medical or dental insurance, you need to do a few background checks yourself. So, to start off, when you're considering buying a frame from China, it's likely you'll hear a number of similar arguments from friends or people in social media groups that you're part of, and the most often heard one is that anything relating to a bike that's cheap and Chinese is going to be crap. However, it usually surprises the people making those comments when they learn that pretty much every big name bike manufacturer has at least a few models in their frame lineup built in the Far East. Now we're talking the likes of Trek, Giant, Factor, Ribble, Specialized, Orbea, Cervelo, Bianchi, Villier, Pinarello, Canyon, Cannondale, and Colnago, just to name but a few off the top of my head. Uh, but all of them have their frames made in China. And don't get me wrong, I know without doubt that there are companies in China who are only interested in making a quick profit and therefore throwing out frames built as cheaply as possible. But China also has major factories building quality products for some of the most reputable bike brands in the world. And often, those big name brands actually share production lines and not always just with the other big name brands. As I say then, if you do your research and really look into the companies you're looking to buy from, you could end up with a frame that comes out of the same factory as one of those big name brands, but at a fraction of the cost, simply because it doesn't have the brand name decal on it. Crazy. But all of that aside, let's get on with actually looking at the bike and the first thing we'll talk about is the frame. Now I bought this frame from a company called Trifox and it cost me £430, which included shipping. This model is the X16TA, with the TA denoting that it's a through axle fitting for the wheels. They do have a QR variant, which, as you might have guessed, has quick release skewers. Now, I first heard of them after watching one of Trace Velo's videos, and I'll link Trace Velo's channel below as Luke does tons of budget AliExpress parts reviews, and the information I got from his videos was, quite honestly, invaluable. Uh, so you should definitely go and check him out. Once I'd found the Trifox though, I did a bit of digging around myself and found quite a few positive reviews online, with people particularly praising their after-sales service should anything go wrong with the frame. Now, for me, that was a big deal because one of the other arguments that you'll hear against using cheap Chinese parts is that you won't get any backup from a company if anything suddenly falls apart. However, while I've not had cause to contact Trifox with any issues, they do seem to have glowing reports online about the help that customers got when things weren't 100%. And so that was a big tick for me. Now that said, uh, I do want to be completely honest about the purchasing process. And one oddity I will point out is that when I first bought the frame, a day or so later, I got a message from the company on AliExpress asking me if I could cancel the order and then go through the checkout process again. I obviously questioned that because it, it seemed a bit odd, but I never really got to the bottom of why it was. Although the company rep kept telling me that no shipping method had originally been selected when I first checked out, but the product listing only had AliExpress standard shipping as an option. So I'm not really sure what happened, but I suspect that it was some kind of shipping admin mistake on their end, uh, but then who knows. Ultimately, I did get an immediate refund, full refund for the original purchase, and then repurchased the frame a few days later. And they even gave me a discount code to bring the price down as the exchange rate over those few days had made it slightly more expensive. So I wasn't out of pocket from the incident, at least. So from the day of the second purchase, uh, it took exactly two weeks to arrive. And when it came, I was actually pleasantly surprised to see how well it was wrapped and packaged. There was plenty of soft foam wrapping uh, around the frame itself, uh, and then lots of padding inside the box to stop it bouncing around. Now, putting the frame together was fairly straightforward, 
Although, just as Luke from Trace Velo found, there were some issues with the holes in the sides of the down tube that the brake cable housing feeds into. They seem to have just been designed at right angles to the frame instead of being angled into them. So the cables tended to stick out quite away from the side of the frame. I fixed this, as Luke did, uh, by buying some small files and gently rubbed around the hole to enable the cable to lay closer against the side of the bike and that solved the problem. Another thing about cabling, which was entirely my fault, unfortunately, is that I didn't route the shift cables through the rubber uh, routing guide underneath the bottom bracket. I actually had no idea that that part actually pops out to make threading the cables and housings under and around the bottom bracket much easier. So I ended up really struggling to get the cables to the rear brakes and the rear derailleur. No fault of the frame there though, just my lack of bike mechanics. And I tell you this, just so that you don't make the same mistake. Essentially though, cabling the bike was the biggest and most time consuming job, not helped by the fact that I bought a set of bars with an integrated stem that had internal cable routing, so I had to feed the cables through some really small holes in that too. I'll come onto the bars in a second, but suffice it to say, I was very happy once I had all the cables pushed through the frame. Now the frame is uh, built for disc brakes and naturally built to accommodate 140 millimeter rotors. However, the brake calipers I bought uh, came with a mounting kit to take a larger 160 millimeter rotor, which is what I ended up fitting. Now 160s are more commonly found on mountain or, and gravel bikes, or at least they were when I built this, it's now more likely you'll see 180 or even 200 millimeter rotors on uh, mountain bikes. But given that I'd never built a bike before though, I decided that having as much stopping power as possible was probably a good thing. So I went for the slightly larger option, but again, more on the brakes later. So just some other general things about the frame just to finish off. Um, it has a brazon derailleur mount and takes a 68 millimeter BSA style threaded bottom bracket. The derailleur I'll come on to in a minute, but the BB was one of the only things I bought from the UK, and it was an Altegra 6800 Holotech 2 style that I got on offer, so that was very cheap. I think that only cost about 15 quid. And finally, the frame came complete with seat post, uh, the fork, and all of the headset bearings and races that you need to put it together. Although I didn't have the expansion plug to go in the steerer, so I ended up picking up one of those cheap from eBay. With the seat post though, it seems to be a proprietary aero design, unless anyone could tell me differently. It hasn't been an issue for me so far, but if the seat post was ever to get damaged or broken, I guess my only replacement option would be through Trifox. Not a major thing, but just something to consider. So onto the bars, and they are again fully carbon fiber from a company called Toseek and cost me 46 pounds. As I mentioned earlier, they have this integrated stem with internal cable routing channels. And I went for the uh, 400 millimeter wide bars with the 100 millimeter long stem. I won't go into too much detail about bar width and stem length because I'm not qualified to give advice on that. But the general rule of thumb is that your bars should be the same width as the distance between the bones of your shoulders. And mine was 40 centimeters, so that's what I went for. Uh, I then went with the 100 mil stem as my old tri-band had a 110 millimeter stem and I always felt like I was just reaching a bit too far on that. So I decided to just bring that back a little bit. Again though, this is fully subjective uh, and completely based on your body size, but using your current bike or any current bike you have to gauge the sizing is not a bad way to go. Now, going back to the cabling for the bars, I had to employ a similar tactic here with the holes on them as with the frame. Not because they were an odd angle though, just because they were far too small for both the brake and shift cables to comfortably fit through. In fairness to the bars, I ended up paying a little bit extra for the Jaguar compressionless housings, uh, which have a Kevlar coating inside. It, that definitely helps transfer as much force as possible from the brake lever to the brakes by not allowing the housing to deform under pressure. However, it does make them quite thick and very difficult to bend round tight corners. So when you match that with the small holes and the tight turns in the bars, you've got the perfect recipe for a headache. Uh, I ended up filing the holes out slightly here as well, similarly to the frame, and was eventually able to fish the two outers through by sliding an end of one of the cables into it and slowly working it out of the bar. It was an absolute nightmare though, and a job that I really don't fancy repeating anytime soon. 
Now, moving on to the brakes, and these are from a company called Z Race on AliExpress, and they cost me £59. Now, these are cable actuated hydraulic disc calipers. So, although they are controlled by a cable, the brake caliper itself has a small oil reservoir inside uh, that does the final triggering of the pistons. Honestly, this wouldn't now be my first choice of brake setup, but back when I built this, fully hydraulic drop shifters and brakes weren't something you could buy on a budget, unfortunately. Now though, a company called L2 have what appears to be a pretty reliable hydraulic braking system that comes in at a fraction of the cost of the comparable Shimano or SRAM setups. All of that said, these brakes haven't been too bad overall, and importantly, I've never had an issue on the odd occasion that I've needed to slam on the anchors in an emergency. I mean, no doubt that fully hydraulic brakes would be better still, but I've got no complaints with these. So onto the crank and sticking with Z-Race for a moment, I also bought the two by crank set from them. And similarly, I've had very few issues with them. Uh, the chain rings themselves are milled from a single piece of aluminium. So there are no screws or anything like that or bolts holding the two rings together that you need to worry about coming loose after you've ridden them for a little while. The only issue I've had with this is the preload screw, which helps push the drive and non-drive side cranks uh, as far into the BB as possible to stop any excessive play from side to side. It was only a couple of months after I'd built the bike that someone pointed out to me that the preload screw was completely missing. In all honesty, I had no recollection of ever fitting it though. Um, and by that point, I had no idea whether it hadn't been sent in the box with a crank set or if I'd simply missed it in all the packaging and ended up throwing it out. Again, my fault for not checking fully, but just another thing to make sure you don't miss if building your own setup. And this crank set cost me 54 quid. Now, to what will probably be the most controversial components on this build, the rest of the group set. So this was sold as a Shimano 105 set on AliExpress, but I have absolutely no way of knowing if it is a genuine or a counterfeit. For the price I paid, which was about 200 quid for both derailers, the rear cassette and the shift levers, and let's be honest, the fact I'm buying it from AliExpress, my gut tells me that it's probably fake. However, there are two things that tend to sway my thinking on this. Firstly, I was buying parts for this bike at the beginning and throughout the COVID pandemic. And so any parts at that time were very difficult to come by, kosher or otherwise. The only place I could find a group set then was AliExpress. And even then, I bought all of these parts from different shops on the site as no one was selling the full group set as a kit. Secondly, the individual components are to the gram exactly the same way as listed for the genuine parts on the Shimano website. Now, to me, this shows that they're either genuine or that they've been made so precisely to mimic the real thing that a lot of care went into them. Either way, I was happy to take the chance on them. And as I said at the beginning, 3000 miles later, they've been largely faultless. I say largely faultless because as I mentioned in one of the vlogs a while ago, a couple of times now, uh, the cable end has slipped out of the channel it sits in inside the shifter for the rear derailleur. I don't honestly think this is a fault of the shifter itself though, and comes down more to the bends in the cable housings, which can stop the cable slipping back and forth through them so easily. So because of that, sometimes when the spring in the rear derailleur tries to pull the cable back, the cable sticks slightly in the housing, but the cable channel in the shifter still moves as you push it, and then the cable end slips out of the channel. If you have slightly more bendy and malleable cables then, and you aren't using an internally rooted cable setup for the handlebars, I really don't think this would be an issue. Moving on to the final major component on the build, we have the wheels. And of the whole build, I think it's these that I'm most happy with. They're from a company called Elite Wheels and they cost me 275 pounds for the pair. Not 275 pounds each, 275 for the pair. Now they're 25 mil wide with a 50 millimeter deep aero profile and they are extremely lightweight at 1.6 kilos combined. Now that is around the same weight as a set of Zip 404 Firecrests, but for a fraction of the cost. Now these wheels, well in fact the entire build has carried me on countless rides and sportives, including 217 miles from Essex to London to Paris back last year, 
the 100 mile ride London route uh, and the 130 mile overnight Dunwich Dynamo as well as countless other weekend rides and events and no part of this bike has skipped a beat in that time. As I pointed out right at the top of this video I've covered roughly 3,000 miles on this bike now and it's caused me very few issues at all since completing it. In fact, the only issues that I have encountered with this bike have all been down to my relative mechanical incompetence. Uh, from my bar tape completely slipping around the bars and bunching up when I did London to Paris because I didn't install it tightly enough, to the front derailleur not being able to push uh, the chain up into the big ring for the first couple of weeks of me riding this bike because I hadn't fully aligned it on the braze on mount. And the only other issue was the non-drive side crank coming loose, but again, that was down to me not installing the preload screw or even checking if I had one. Other than those things, this bike has been an absolute dream to own and ride. Now, there is a little bit of work and fettling to do with building these bikes yourself, which you wouldn't necessarily have to go through if you bought a big name bike that's already built. But then the trade-off is that you save yourself a huge amount of money, which I'm coming to. So ultimately, would I recommend building a bike yourself to anyone else? The answer is absolutely yes. So long as you have a vague idea of how things go together, you should be absolutely fine. And when I say vague idea, I do literally mean that as I had absolutely zero bike mechanic knowledge before building this bike, and I'd only ever performed the odd bit of basic maintenance on my tri-band prior to this, so I was, and still am, in no way an expert bike builder. But let's be honest, there's nothing that can't be learned from YouTube these days, so honestly, there really isn't anything stopping you. The one thing I would recommend against though is the fully integrated bar and stem with the internal cable routing, as this definitely causes excessive bends in the cable housings, which has led to issues with shifting and braking, and was a complete nightmare of a job to complete in the first place. It hasn't caused enough of an issue for me to change it all completely now it's built, but I'd definitely try something different if I were to self-build again. So just a very quick break in the video here to ask you to consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already done so. If you're enjoying this video and finding it informative, then hopefully you'd feel the same about my other videos, which are all cycling related. Also, I'd love it if you could hit the like button and leave a comment as that really helps me push my videos out to others who might be interested in it and ultimately helps me continue to grow and bring you guys bigger and better content on here. Thanks very much. So with all of that said, I know that the main draw for building a bike like this yourself is the cost saving. And so with all of the components that I've mentioned and adding in a few other minor things needed like saddle, pedals and consumables like the chain, tires and bar tape, etc. This full build comes in at just over £1,200 and weighs in at a slender 7.9 kilos. So 1,200 quid for a sub 8 kilo bike with a full carbon fibre frame, fork, handlebar and wheel set. And I think that is an incredible price. In fact, you would struggle to buy some carbon wheel sets for less than this entire build cost. And that is crazy. So it's fairly clear that I love this bike and fully see it carrying me for many more thousands of miles over the years. But what do you guys think? Would you build a bike like this or have you already built a bike like this from cheap Chinese parts? Uh, or on the other hand, are you more comfortable and more happier to pay the extra cost for the implied confidence that comes from a big name brand? Sound off in the comments below as I'd love to hear your thoughts either way. Otherwise though, as ever, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care.